Thank you very much, Hannah. Indeed, I'm not going to talk about oil or diplomats or, in fact, all those major concerns that may interest uh, most of us, but rather perhaps about concerns that interest ordinary people, and that's the perspective I take in my research. So I'm going to look at the stuff that is called culture, and that's a term that I think um, kind of probably annoys a lot of us here. Anyways, I'm going to start by saying that I came to Helsinki, to Finland, for the first time seven years ago on the invitation of Alexander Institute, and it's been a fantastic journey for me. Um, so when I came here seven years ago, Helsinki was a different place. Those who have been here at that time would know that it was a less a global space than it is now. It is visually recognizably kind of uh, more global than it appeared to me in the darkness of that winter in, in 2010. Um, and I came to Helsinki um, after having taken a position uh, at the University of Leeds and just moved, uh, moving from the University of Pittsburgh in America. And what I brought with me when I came to Helsinki, this very strong Anglo-American paradigm of thinking about the world, thinking about the Russian Federation and the Russian world, which in many ways is a kind of a binary structure, uh, and that is seeing the world divided between what we kind of understand as the West and non-West. And what I learned in Helsinki very quickly is that even within the West, there is a very particular reading, a very different reading of those uh, global flows. And what I learned in Helsinki by kind of working with these wonderful people here is not only to think globally, but also do things globally, to reach out to other parts of the world, other colleagues, and engage with them in very productive ways. Um, and so Finland has remained one of the kind of centers of my intellectual work ever since, and I'm really privileged to be here again today and speak to you about that experience. But I also wanted to say that after my kind of stay here in Helsinki, I try to reach out to kind of colleagues working elsewhere. And there are three other countries in the world that I've been kind of looking at, trying to, to kind of gauge a sense of how things are perceived elsewhere. And those countries are Turkey, Brazil, and Thailand. It's a quite a random combination, just I happen to have doctoral students coming from those parts of the world, and so they bring with them their expertise and I kind of get to know what people see and, and feel elsewhere. And so what I want to say is that um, although uh, four out of five speakers on this panel are actually representing again that Anglo-American paradigm, right? Um, I think three of us are from the UK and one from the United States. I'd like to kind of talk about these things in a, in a slightly different way. And particularly, obviously, as I do work on film and digital media, is to say that messages now circulate beyond the official institutions, beyond the kind of work of governments. And I think this is actually where interesting things do happen. In many ways, my work is about contemporaneity. I try to make sense of what it means to live the contemporary world in the now. Unlike people who, for, who work, for example, in political science or social science, who probably deal with the past and look into the future and try, as the speaker just before me, try to make predictions about how a particular nation may evolve in the future. And so, what's going on now? What kind of event um, is my attention drawn to today? And there is actually a very significant event that I wanted to comment on before I kind of try to present some kind of big ideas towards the end of my presentation. So as we speak now, literally, at this, uh, this moment, there's a court hearing taking place in Moscow in the Russian Federation. A person who's been brought to court is called Kirill Serebrenikov, and some of you may actually know of him. Um, he's actually um, a, a film director and a stage director who about three weeks ago got the, the prize from the European Association of uh, Theatrical Workers as the leading talent in the European Union. And that is kind of in celebration of his work that he's done in the Russian Federation, but also in Latvia, where he's actually uh, the invited director in the National Theatre, and also in Berlin and Stuttgart and elsewhere, and, and also France. Now, I'd like to use this um, uh, situation to, to highlight a few very important things here. First of all is, uh, indeed, the spaces of Russian activity, the spaces of Russian culture of, uh, of that extent uh, are really global, not necessarily kind of pertaining to the Russian Federation or particular regions. And in fact, um, Russian elites are powerful everywhere in the world, and I'm not only talking about government-sponsored elites, for example, RT and its kind of representatives in the UK, Finland, elsewhere, but also what we, what we can call liberal elites. 
For example, The Guardian and New York Times published about the arrest of Kirill Serenikov literally a few hours after he was taken to custody in Moscow. I'm saying this because when similar events take place in Turkey or Thailand, they are not reported uh, in at least Western media that I'm kind of monitoring. And again, I want to emphasize not only a connection between the EU, uh, in this case, and the Russian Federation, but the power of those elites of all kinds. Now, Sirebrenikov is in custody in Moscow, and the hearing is taking place as we're sitting here, is because he's accused of financial embezzlement. Um, they, they're trying to claim that he and his other people that, uh, that worked in his theater stole some money um, about 10 years ago from the state. Now, here I'd like to go to a point that a speaker before me made, and that is the period of the 1990s remains a very important period for the Russian Federation, but also for the world, because we're still uncertain about how to interpret those events uh, that took place 25 years ago, and particularly that we haven't really looked into the way those events affected not only the so-called former Soviet space, but also the global space. And here, for those of you who are kind of interested in theory, may look at the kind of wonderful book by Alain Badiou called The Soviet Century, where he really describes the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century as a century built on the infrastructure of that sort of um, Russian agenda. Um, so this is the official kind of uh, reason for uh, taking Serebrenikov into custody, but we can speculate about the kind of the true cause of it. And one of them is perhaps that he is a director who is not afraid to talk about his homosexuality, who is not afraid to put on uh, a critique of the church and the current regime for a global audience. And what's really interesting is that as the court hearing is taking place in Moscow, there is a demonstration taking place outside the, uh, the court, and there's a kind of a global following of that event thanks to the digital media. So here, I'm interested in another phenomenon and something that I wanted to draw our attention to, and that is this global spectacle that Russia is taking part in. And it is very, very kind of keen and eager and uh, capable of actually setting up the agenda and keeping the attention of the global uh, community, no matter whether that attention is towards positive or negative events. And it really robs countries like Finland or Estonia and smaller agents from that global attention. Um, another interesting phenomenon that I'd like to talk about, and that is there is a video camera set up in the court that kind of shows you in, in, the, kind of, in the moment uh, of what is actually going on. And that is done with the purpose of making Russian courts more transparent so that anyone can actually tune in and see what's going on and take part in it. But as a media scholar, I really wonder whether that is a step towards transparency or in fact towards global uh, surveillance. And here, again, I'd like to make a point about other things that um, other speakers raise and probably try to kind of frame them in a different way. And that is that when we talk about the Russia and its impact on the world, we always forget that Russia is like many other agents in the world are trying to make sense of the agenda presented in the US. I'll give you a non-political, sort of non-political, cinematic example. And that is... The movies that Russians go to see are actually American movies, and I always wonder what they make of them. Uh, Russians don't see Russian movies or Russian-made movies. They're not interested in them. And therefore, there is an interesting discourse about how that ne neoliberal agenda is interpreted around the world and whether actually a Russian case can teach us more about countries like Thailand, where actually all members of the public have to stand up before the, official, the, the screening of films uh, in cinemas because they play the national anthem. And if you do not stand up, you'll be arrested and spend a long time in jail. Another point I want to make here um, is that uh, we, we tend to over-focus on government agency, paying very little attention to non-government agency. So I'll give you just one more example and I'll finish here. So in Sao Paulo, Brazil, there are two interesting things uh, emerging. One of them is that there's the presence of the Bolshoi theater that works with uh, very poor communities out there. Uh, uh, children who have never been to school are, are, are able to actually come and, and practice ballet with performers from Moscow. And that's a fantastic soft power tool that the Russian government could have used but has not done 
to tell the world about that kind of uh, initiative. And the other one I wanted to mention is that um, there is um, uh, the so-called uh, School of Design set up by private individuals in Moscow who opened their school also in Sao Paulo where they train a local talent how to become programmers. But you can know, actually also see how they're using that talent for their own agenda. What is fascinating about that adventure is that it actually uses a brand of a British university to actually kind of operate in South America, and that is the first uh, kind of uh, adventure of that type in that whole space. What is there to transform not only the kind of the local setting but also global communication networks? Because let me remind you that South America does not have a direct internet link to Europe. The cable goes through the United States. And for example, in that way, Brazilian journalists do not have their representatives in other parts of the world. The first Brazilian journalist to have been placed in India only was there about 12 years ago. All the news that is presented in Brazil is presented through the perspective of Reuters. Okay, thank you. I'm done.